By 2038, it's predicted that there will be more than 5.5 million people living in New Zealand, but the average size of households will decrease to 2.5 people, and people living alone will make up a quarter of those households. This country has always had a diverse idea of what makes up a family, so how's that going to look in the future? I'm Megan Whelan and this is Great Ideas. Last season we looked at the revolutionary ideas of the past. This time around we're asking what the great ideas of the future will be. We'll look at leisure and communication and work. This episode though, the future of families. I'm joined by three knowledgeable people from AUT and I've asked them to tell us their favourite thing to do with their family. Kia ora Megan, Um, I'm Alison. Favourite thing to do um, is for... Um, my husband and my daughter, Rachel, who's seven, and I, we all go out to visit ponies out in uh, Henderson, where she's been going since she was three. She decided she wanted to uh, see. So we go out there, we pat them, we ride them, and it's just lovely, really relaxing, really fantastic time. And just so the listeners know, you're Alison Cleland. Yep. And you are? A, a family law lecturer and child law lecturer at AUT. Lovely. Kia ora. I'm Rhoda Sherman. I'm a senior lecturer in psychology. Uh, I'm here on my own. I moved here 20 years ago. But uh, thinking back, probably a favourite thing to do with my family was play Chapman Rummy. Chapman being my, my brother-in-law's family and a rather uh, unique form of rummy. Around the table on a dark and cold Alaskan night in the middle of winter with the sound of a crackling fireplace in the background. Uh, for Megan. My name is Alshadan Tautolo. Uh, I'm a Senior Research Fellow and Director of the Centre for Pacific Health at AUT. And one of the things that I really enjoy doing with my family is taking our two children's uh, Pacifica group at school um, because they really enjoy um, cultural dancing and those kinds of things and I know that they really enjoy sharing that with the other kids at school as well so yeah that's what I really like doing. Excellent. All right, Rada, I'm going to start with you. The idea of a family, a very western idea of the family is two parents, a couple of kids, probably a dog, all living in the same household. Is that that, that feels like maybe it's a relatively modern idea of what a family is. If we think about the history of people, if we go back hundreds of years, yeah, I'm sure it is a modern notion of the family. I think that, but whether modern or old, whether nuclear or very large and encompassing multiple generations, I think that... I think what's important isn't its makeup as much as its purpose and its role. And and I think the role of families, for the most part, hasn't changed much. It's it's about growing the subsequent generations and what that looks like, how many are in the family, who that is. That's the part that differs historically, culturally. You think that's true? I don't know. Yeah. Cause that's Well, sounds like talking about the growing, the, the next generation. I, I don't know if, because I'd say that probably the modern notion is that, that narrow nuclear family or the all the individuals in that nuclear family, whereas um, what's been around forever and we're a social animal, aren't we, has been everybody um, getting together. But I, I'm not sure that the, the main purpose, I think I think the law thought the main purpose was breeding, basically, which is why it all had this this notion about marriage and all, all these things, yeah. which I'm sure we'll get into later. But but probably the idea about support That's for, what I was for all, say. all different yeah. generations, not, not just the... And the, I don't mean just support. Up, you know? I think I mean the family, the unit of family it's predicated on the birth of children, the breeding, the bringing in the next generation, and then there may be multiple generations within the family. But if we stop having children, families will die out, which is why I I think then it's about always at some level the subsequent children coming in in the family and but the makeup and what it looks like and how many, that will be very historically and culturally predicated. I think from a Pacific perspective, yeah, there's notions around this this sort of singular nuclear unit. But, I mean, being from a collective kind of culture, I think we're having multiple groups within a family or generations, you know, contributing to raising kids and things like that is, is something really common and that we've, you know, always kind of had. So in, in the future... 
We're going to have uh, more single-person households, more households of fewer people, but also, especially here in Auckland, more multi-family households as the housing prices and population Mm -hmm. pressures have, and also cultural pressures. Multi-person households are common in a lot of a lot of the cultures that are now represented in this country. Is there a point at which we're going to have to say, actually, this is, you know, we need to widen our definition of what a family is? Well, the law is definitely going to have to. Um, the law is, it's always 10 years behind the plot in any event. Um, if you, if you're only interested in individual rights like the parent and the, and the yeah. child mm-hmm. and you recognise only that, then you, you knock out all these other people. Um, I mean, it's no surprise that public are very sceptical of, of the family courts and they don't think the family courts mm-hmm. have done yeah. a great job because they don't recognise people I and mean, you have to get special standing, you know, if, if you want to get the court to say something about your mokopuna. I mean, that's ridiculous. Yeah. And I think that's one of the dangers too, is because you know, yeah, when you get into that defining thing in terms of who's contributing, if it's a, if you're only looking at, for example, the people who economically contribute to you know supporting this child, there could be five or six other individuals within the household and family that are doing various other things which are you know equally as important or maybe more important. I, I think also the image of you were describing, Alison, of the two parent and the child. It's a very heteronormative Absolutely. image as well, and. Right away, that has to change because it, we have same-sex parents. We have um, we have different multiple generations where it might be grandparent-headed. It, we have um, people who are not even biologically related. And in fact, I think that the the fundamental shift that's going to happen with families in the future is an increase in the separation of genetic, gestational, and social parenting. And that is going to then create uh, families that look very different, very different than they look now. We already have step parents and uh, blended families. Blended families, thank you. That's the word I was looking for. So we already have that. We're already doing that. And I have lots of friends who are step parents who get a bit frustrated with the idea that they're not parenting because they're only the step parents. Yeah, I agree. I, I am one of those people who's a step parent. I married my wife and she already had a young a young daughter and we've got two kids now since since then. But yeah, there's, you're right, there's a lot of issues there in terms of what kind of say you have in terms of what's happening. Even though, I mean, with our daughter... We're raising her, I'm raising her, contact with her date every day, all of that kind of stuff, and, and also with her siblings as well. I mentioned uh, IVF, and that adds a sort of extra layer of complication. You, Alison said uh, the idea of, you know, you could tell who the mother was yeah. because yes. mm. she was the one who gave birth, but that's not even true anymore. Yeah. No, no, it's not. And again, with as far as the law is concerned, it, it, it likes to keep it simple, which one of the reasons why it's not that keen on having more than two um, genders for a start that are recognised legally. Um, but it, it recognises the person who gives birth as the mother. We have a long tradition of excluding the non-legal parent in New Zealand and in other countries. As more countries pass legislation allowing same-sex marriage, that's so important because that marriage you know that that particular contract, Legal contract is the gateway to so to family mm-hmm. it's the gateway to family for many because you have to have that that license in order to in New Zealand to adopt mm-hmm. as a couple you have to be married otherwise it's a single person adoption and you have a parent who's excluded who's invisible and there's a you know fairly robust body of research that talks about this in invisibility of a parent and it undermines all aspects of family engagement the socio-emotional aspects and um, to have this parent who's not legitimized but, outside but it doesn't even family. it doesn't even reflect the the child's reality yeah. and, and the, the child right, even if you're talking about a child's right to identity or no yeah. but the the reality of who's around them and who's actually bringing yeah. them mm. up and who's important to them yeah, yeah. And so there's this tension between outside the family and who's legally allowed to make decisions if there's an emergency and and the child's in hospital, but it's the non-legal parent. But as a as, as a psychologist, my issue is the psychological and emotional toll that puts on the couple and on the family mm-hmm. when you have a member 
you know, systematically, institutionally ignored and made invisible. It was especially when you get into a situation where there is, say, if you if it's a, say it's a lesbian couple, so you have the two women who are involved, you obviously had to have a sperm donor, so one partner already feels like they haven't contributed you know that they're not that they're not a, part, a physical part of that child or whatever and then if you have a situation where they are legally not recognized you can totally see how that would absolutely take a toll on your brain to, to think well I love this child I'm parenting this child I have a relationship with this child but no one actually recognizes me as this child's and the family. other parent is getting all the mm. reinforcement mm. even if the non-recognized parent might even be doing a greater share of the mm. caretaking. So it creates tension. Mm. It sets the family up for a lot of challenges that it shouldn't have to have mm. simply because one parent is legally recognized and the other isn't. And with when it's a lesbian couple, it's very obvious, you know, whether one came out of the womb of one or the other. We see with gay men the mixing of sperm so that there's an uncertainty but the certainty is there with the women um, because it's come out of her body and she can't contribute to it if it isn't coming out of her egg. And so. Psychologically, what, what about the, the children in these situations? Because I suppose I've my limited knowledge, which is really limited in terms of child psychology, is that the children are very adaptable if they're given key, key messages. And, and the Children don't care. They don't have any sense of legal parentage. It's about who's there for them, who meets their needs, their physical needs, their emotional needs, their social needs. And Megan, in terms of, you know, your your view of what a family is, again, I, that's why I come back to that point of it's about the children, because children will see the family through a lens that's so different than the law sees it. And, and there's often a real disjoint in terms of a family is whoever the people are that are growing these children and caring for these children. We hear a lot about, well, we occasionally hear a lot about the, depending on who you listen to, the decline of the family because of things like marriage equality and same-sex couples being able to, to marry. Is there any evidence that that's true? No. I think what people are thinking about is that nuclear, Christian, heterosexual, headed, biological family. That's on the decline, but that's been on the decline for a long time because of the step and blended families that we've been mm -hmm. seeing. Now we just have new categories that are coming in. But the phenomenal increase in infertility around the world means that, you know, for a long time, people have been looking for alternate ways to form families. And which, again, brings us to the, the separation of genetics and gestation and the social parenting that's been happening for a long time. So I think when people say that all of these, you know, non-traditional ways of forming families, gay and lesbian, I think sometimes it's just a reflection of bigoted attitudes about homosexuality. We are, we do have declining numbers of the heterosexual headed biological family, but the ideals of family, the value of family, the what families do, that just keeps happening despite its makeup, its numbers, its sexuality of its members. We have good laws around adoption now, right? We, we no, understand. Oh, 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 OK, no. good. Excellent. No. Adoption law is the is absolutely yeah. the worst area, uh, particularly in, in New Zealand. And yes. um, of course, yeah, sorry, got a bit of a no, soapbox no. here, but let, let's start with adoption um, as a legal concept to start with, which has always been an entirely constructed, this is about adults' rights, and it's been nothing to do with children. It's very latecomer to, to the legal lexicon in any event. Um, so it came along, and what we did again was we took the, the UK adoption model, which was you get two married people and you give them a child, and that's all lovely. Yeah. And and we know why that came came about. And it's very, very simplistic. It's, it's based on this idea of married people who are then legitimately okay and able to have a child. Um, so we get them into that box, and and then we tick that box and then we do lots and lots of checks and then we give them a child. And then we import that here and then we don't change it. And we leave it in this little time warp yeah. where we have a, a concept of adoption that was literally about babies 
being given to childless couples, um, fueled by all the, the negativity around single females. And we just leave it at that and we don't revise it or change it. It's now 12 years since the Law Commission said adoption law needs to be massively changed and the government, successive governments have simply Nobody said... Nobody wants to touch it's it. Not. And one of the reasons, bef before we get on to adoption itself, I would just like to say I was a, a children's rights lawyer in, in Scotland. That was my thing and I represented children and young people. And one of the things that we haven't talked about really at the moment is the invisibility of, of children themselves and mm. their voices and, and yeah. hearing their perspective, you know. As long as you view a child as an object that you can give to parents yeah. and that's like a prize, that's great. Mm. If you see them as an individual who might have interests in their yeah. genetic makeup yeah. and their, you know, where they came from and all of these things, it gets, gets a bit complicated. Mm. And the law's just not bother dealing with it. And I was just going to say, and sorry about the soapbox, that one of the reasons I'm absolutely certain that they have not, they've just completely ignored adoption law, there'll be other reasons too, is because the idea of children's rights and having law that reflects children's reality is way, way down. It's, it doesn't even appear on the political spectrum at all. Children don't vote. There aren't that many votes uh, in them. There's, there's votes on being down on young people who are, might be offenders, you know, but that's it. They just, it's just not a priority. So you've got a law that's very much about a child for every home, but you have a social welfare system that's about a home for every child. And they look like they are in tandem but they're not exactly as Allison says because it's we've got conflicting rights the rights of the child versus the rights of the parents and and we we use the phrase in the best interests of the child a lot we vary very much on what that means and how we define that but we're not usually working in the frame of the best interests of the child it's about a child for every home because it's parents who instigate the desire to have a child. Mm. And and so and the adoption law from my perspective the, the 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 central focus of it was legitimizing the the child and and out of an era where one must be married the the marriage context is the only way in which children can enter otherwise you're a bastard. And in, now in 2017, that's not a word that we use unless we're just replacing it for some other cuss word about somebody. But in true, in terms of it, you know, its notion of being born from unwed parents, nobody cares about that. Forgive me that. I don't care about that. Most people I know don't care about that. There might be others who care about that. And but, isn't but, it interesting because it, New Zealand society didn't either. Yeah. Here's a law that's that's based on all these prejudices that are being described. Um, but New Zealand legitimised children born out of wedlock quicker than any other uh, Western country and any other common law country. We never had a bias against unmarried people in terms of recognising de facto couples. Yeah. You know, it took us a while to get same-sex marriage, but nonetheless, we had civil unions and we had de facto relationships recognised. There was never the same kind of heated debate around, oh, well, you know, if, if you give de facto couples and married couples the same, then you're somehow undermining marriage and society will crumble. All of these things that were discussed. In but the yet UK it's still embedded States. in the adoption law, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, from 1955. So it hasn't been changed since 1955? No. no. So no. it predates every law that's changed around Correct. marriages yes. and around relationships and every bit of scientific technology that's enabling people to have families yes. in non-traditional and even just our social parts. our even our just our, our social and we don't hold any of the biases around single parenting about you know a woman or, being able to well no what i mean in terms of in the 50s a woman gets pregnant out of wedlock and it you know, it ruins families. It doesn't ruin families today. And in fact, a lot of people, it's a it's a lifestyle choice to stay unmarried and to have a child. So in that in that sense, we don't have the societal lens that pushed so many young unwed mothers to have to relinquish their children. The the historical sense of that is is largely responsible for why New Zealand is such a prolific country of adopter or a, a country with such prolific history of adoption. We were placing 
almost 7% of our children for adoption in the late 60s and early 70s, a number that none of the other Western countries have reached. So we have a long history of adoption practice, but yet we have such antiquated adoption laws. And I think part of it is also we have laws that have come along, as you say, since that have rectified some of the problems. And I've often wondered if that's why the adoption law just gets left because they're finding ways around it. We've just had a, a recent, the Human Rights Commission had a successful decision with the Human Rights Tribunal, which said basically the adoption law breaches all the human rights legislation, etc. That's what you'd expect, right? Um, and so you'd think, well, surely now they must change it. But there's a really serious issue around whether or not adoption as a concept is a useful one and an appropriate one to use in a context where we have Māori particularly, who, uh, for whom the whakapapa and the genealogy is absolutely crucial. And uh, this idea... But that's only about how adoption is, is defined, because I adoption doesn't have to be closed. Yeah, but do you not think it, it's more fundamental than that? Because the, the idea, Māori society has whangai, right? Right. So the idea you would be looking after... It's somebody now. But you're taking a child from one family and placing it in another, which is not unlike adoption. It's just that adoption from a Western definition is about removing a child and keeping the illusion of as if born to. And that's what severs them from their papa. If we don't have to maintain that illusion of as, as if born to, and we, we perceive it in an open context, which child, youth, and family has practiced since the 80s, then adoption, the definition of adoption, isn't the problem. Well, well yeah, but the, the thing is, though, if you, pr- you say that child, youth and families practiced it um, in the 80s, that's true in that they haven't used a closed model adoption, but they're still placing Māori children in white families, in Pākehā families, because, you know, Māori... Are they? Know, My understanding they... is th- they don't. They well, stopped that decades ago. Well... But the thing is, if you're talking about those who are available to look after um, children and the huge numbers of of Maori children who are in care, right, Um, we don't have a whole lot of of Maori whānau who are able to do it. But if they legalised whāngai, that would solve that. But whāngai is not a legally recognised mechanism for looking after children. And and that in this country is ludicrous. And this might not be a popular opinion, but I mean, I emigrated here 20 years ago because of my interest in adoption, because of my keen desire to do research and, and advance the field through research, because New Zealand had some of the most progressive adoption practices in the world. Now, our adoption law is as old as they come, but we still have good practices that deal with making sure children have access to their papa and openness available to to have contact with birth family. And, and for adult adoptees, for instance, um, with the passage of the Adult Adoption Information Act in the 80s, where an adopted person, when they reach maturity, they they can petition for access to their records. Just to give you a context, there are only 10 states in the U.S. that give you similar rights, which means that there are 40 states where right now, in 2017, an adopted person of any age has no legal right to their birth records. That, to me, is phenomenally ludicrous. And New Zealand worked that out back in the 80s, how important that was. So I think in some ways we have some very progressive practices around adoption, foster care. Even our Human Assisted Reproductive Technology Act addresses a lot of these really important issues. But our adoption law, (laughs) that's, that's the, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Alison. I mean, I think it's something that we really need to look at quite seriously. I mean, for Pacific people as well, I think there's, you know, huge numbers that are in care and needing of families. And um, 
you know, there's just such pressure to try and find people to take on um, these kids and children. I mean, f- from my own um, experience, I have a sister-in-law who was approached to take on a, uh, I think it was a five-year-old and a 18-month-old baby because she was new Anne and the kids were new Anne. And the consequence of if they weren't able to take on these kids was that they would be split up and they would go. And especially uh, in mean, the would, population of new yeah. is 1,400? Yeah, so, so you know, um, there's huge issues yeah. there trying to find appropriate you see, I, I families. Think, yeah, you know? my worry would be as well. I mean, we couldn't be very critical of of, of adoption or, or whatever, but it, it kind of misses the point in relation to if we've got a large number of children, largely who are Maori and Pacific Islander, not only, who are, they, they might have a progressive, I mean, yeah, I bow to your knowledge on that one in terms of um, the progressive practices, OK? Um, but but the point is, we're still um, bringing lots of Māori uh, and Pacifica young people in, into care. And then, what are we doing with them? Yeah. What, what, what about this? So if we're talking about what does the family look like, yeah. if there is a, a significant minority of of Yep. young people children and children care. who are not getting the support. So mm-hmm. the question then becomes, well, if, if we're talking about who who supports a, a, a family and you don't have the resources in, in that family and people, and people know it in relation to poverty and housing and all of these things, then the bigger question is, is not about the law and what it yeah. says. It's about are you going to put your money where your mouth yeah. is in yeah. terms of uh, that support? Because that's the recognition of the family, never mind what the, uh, the actual law says. Yeah. Yeah. And in practice, child, youth and family doesn't preference adoption. Uh, you know, for, for all of our discussion of adoption and adoption law, my sense is it's going the way of the dinosaur, to be perfectly honest. That said, though, if the future is families that don't look like the traditional heterosexual family, don't you need a recognition? So if you've got same-sex couples either adopting or using assisted reproductive technology, if you've got single people doing those things, if you've got multi-generational families in a house, if you've got whangai ab- adoption, if you've got all of these things, don't you need at some point a framework to recognise all of those things in a way to make it so that we can look after families. I think that's the ideal, but I well, see. I think. Can't see that I mean, it's, maybe it sounds very, very simplistic, but I think tikanga Māori and and Whanungatanga and some of these concepts has recognised it. Mm. The, the problem then is that the law and society hasn't recognised that properly. I mean, the Children, Young Persons, Their Families Act is a classic example. It's got Fano Hapu and Iwi all the way through. We put in family group conferences, which is world recognised as a you know a proper consensus making decision that it's a collective idea, and so you you put that in place, and then the question then becomes well, how far do you recognise it? Well, we know we don't recognise Fangai, we haven't got Fanongatanga or these other things, and we're still looking at these individuals and giving individual rights. We, mm. we're, we're not able to, to recognise collective. So ideally, what would be perfect would be to rewrite your, your, your family laws, have the discussion, it would be really complicated, and say, look, um, in Aotearoa, um, we have a different structure. We can learn a huge amount from tikanga Māori um, and some of these key concepts. If, if, if Whanongatanga and Whakapapa, that pretty much it's there, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it it's, we should really put our put our thinking caps on to how do we get that into law. I guess it's about prioritising and putting that as the focus or at the centre of anything that was to develop and then going from there, yeah, but you, I agree with you, yeah. Well, parenting's hard. R- regardless of, of how you do it, regardless of what your biological, what is it, biological, gestational or social uh, relationship with the child is, parenting is difficult no matter which, where you come along in that. Yeah, and I, and I mean perhaps there's things we can put in place in terms of support and other things for um, people teaching them about you know, parenting. For example, there, uh, there may be practices or behaviours that you've picked up from your own upbringing and how do you, as specific people, how do you bring that into a New Zealand context and raising children perhaps here rather than back in the Pacific Islands. So I think there's some of that work that's going on in terms of support and services that are available, but certainly um, more would be would be ideal, be uh, positive. Also, I, I suppose more recognition around the role of um, of uh, fathers uh, in terms of raising kids and um, the important role that they can play. 
in terms of how their kids develop and, you know, positive role modelling and those kinds of things. I think that's really important. And I think society, well, New Zealand society is changing in terms of, you know, fathers being stay-home dads looking after kids and not being the primary Breaking financial in, yeah. person, perhaps, I think. And that is changing, though, slowly. Yeah. I'd like to throw a shout-out to aunties, because aunties are very important. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of lot of really good research that's been emerging for the last decade or so, really empirically showing how essential fathers are to families. And, you know, and it's on the heels of, as you were saying, you know, mother-child. We, you know, in psychology, all of our early research and development was about the mother-child dyad. And fathers, you know, were hardly acknowledged. And, and in adoption, you know, in, in often it's a, it's a birth mother who might relinquish and often questions of who's the father and where is he and his rights. And fathers are so maligned when it comes to family studies. And, and yet we know they're so important for the children. And the system and- at the other end, in terms of youth justice, is having to is, is recognising the central importance of of the role model, the, the male role model for our, our young uh, young people who are going through the youth justice system. If we're going to, we do it. We actually do a very good job in in Aotearoa of diverting a very large number of young people um, from the criminal path. But you know, for those young people from whom it's difficult undoubtedly who've come through the uh, child youth and family system, child protection, all the rest of it, um, they need those those mentors and models and oh, they're trying they to... Those fathers the, involved the, yeah. and father figures and, yeah. Given declining infertility rates, more single women than single men, and the fact that we now have the technology to create a family, essentially, to have a child are we but IVF is incredibly expensive and the processes around uh, having uh, doing that are expensive and time consuming and difficult are we getting into a position where people are going to be shut out of having a family I don't think so I think there's I understand what you're saying and I think that certain technologies are going to be available to some and not available to others but I think that the urge the drive to have children, to parent, will never go away. And I think we will continue to to find creative ways to form families. And again, they're not all going to be biological. And the IVF allows that. Surrogacy allows that. Hence the fact that, in in my mind, it's the new black. Um, But uh, as opposed to adoption and foster care and other methods of family formation. I think that IVF is probably going to be, yeah, limited to smaller numbers. But I think that people will find ways to form families. Adoption will probably always be there, foster care, guardianship. There'll be other ways, step families, blended families. There'll be really more informal ways of of families being structured that may not be genetic. I think for Pacific people, you know, with that collective, multiple families and, and households and all of that kind of thing, um, yeah, there's never going to be a shortage of opportunities to be a parent or, or help to raise a child. My thanks to Dr. Al Shadan Tautolu, Alison Cleland and Dr. Rhoda Sherman. Great Ideas is made in collaboration with AUT. Our sound engineer was Rangi Pawik and our executive producer is Tim Watkin. I'm Megan Whelan. You can find more great RNZ podcasts at rnz.co.nz on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you get your favourite podcasts. Mm-hmm.